is Allison Burke, and I'm the president of Bay Napa Psy, and I want to thank you all for coming to our first meeting, and we're really excited to have AutoZone here tonight. Um, a couple of announcements. There's a signing sheet going around, so please make sure you um, sign your name um, before the meeting ends, and then please silence your cell phones, and um, I'll make a few other announcements at the end of the meeting, too. And then now Ian is going to present our speakers. Hey, I'm Ian. I'm the VP of Programming this year. So our speakers today, we have Drew Tannis, who went here for undergrad and grad, has been with AutoZone for three months. Leah Clayton went to state and has been with AutoZone for six years. And then... you're not moving. And Nasheen Bagut has been with AutoZone for four and a half years. Thank you. Um, we're really excited to be here with you all tonight. I didn't realize this was your first meeting, so yeah, yeah that's great. Um, we've got some exciting material. Wanted to kind of talk to you all about um, careers in industry versus public accounting. Um, so we're all three from the internal audit department at all the time specifically. So a lot of our presentation will be discussing what we do as internal auditors and how that compares to um, public accounting and external audit field. Um, so if you want to us. Um, so we'll kind of quickly give a little bit of background on AutoZone just so you have a context of what we're talking about. We won't spend much time there. Um, we'll discuss industry accounting. We're going to kind of walk through what a finance organization looks like and the types of positions that are available to you in industry accounting with most of our focus being on internal audit. And then we'll compare internal audit and external audit, key differences, comparisons. And then Drew is going to give a little background on um, IT audit. So a little bit more about myself. I um, started at AutoZone six years ago. I'm currently the internal audit manager, one of three internal audit managers in our department. Um, four of my six years at AutoZone have been in internal audit. The other two were in what we call a control team. I'm gonna talk a little bit about later. Um, essentially, it's like the accounting group for one of our functional areas. So I spent two years in our supply chain control team doing the budgeting and analysis for our domestic um, distribution operation. So if we'll go to the next slide, and the next slide, thank you. Um, just wanted to give you a little bit of background on AutoZone. A lot of people, before I started working at AutoZone, all I thought about were there's a store down the street that I bought a battery from one time, but I didn't think about it as a corporate entity. So um, just so you've got some background, our company was started in 1979, so this year we're celebrating our 40th anniversary. Um, it was started in Forest City, Arkansas, which is about 40 miles from Memphis, which is where we're headquartered. Um, when you think about AutoZone, if this has got our lines of business, what you primarily think of probably is our DIY segment, or like you and I walking into an AutoZone store to buy a battery for a car, to buy a windshield wiper for our car. We also have a commercial program where we sell to mechanics who you would take your car to Firestone or a Sears Auto, and they would work on your car. We sell to those customers as well. That is currently our largest growth opportunity for the company. Um, next, we've got a subsidiary out of Elk Grove, California that's called All Data. And what they do, they're a diagnostic repair software solution. Um, they're the leader in their industry. But what that means typically, so like your Firestone would have a software solution that reads codes within your car that says, okay, this is what's wrong with your vehicle, this is how you fix it. So that's what All, All Data really does. Um, over the 40 years that we've been a company, we've grown to over 6,000 stores. We're located in Mexico and Brazil, in addition to the United States. Fortune 300 company, like this past year, we've had about 11.9 billion in sales. So it's been a lot of great growth over the past 40 years. Um, like I mentioned, we're headquartered in Memphis. This is our building. We've got about 1,800 people that work in the corporate headquarters in Memphis. We call it the store support center. We don't really say headquarters. but um, And then we've got about 90,000 people across the country, Mexico and Brazil, that work so I kind of wanted to talk to you all a little bit about what are the opportunities for you in industry accounting. I know a lot of accounting students right out of school will work in public accounting and then after two or three years will be looking for something in industry. So hopefully this kind of like piques your interest in some potential opportunities for you in the future. Um, I'm going to be asking Drew and Nosheen to kind of give some examples of their time. They both worked in public accounting prior to working at AutoZone. So they've got a good feel of what both look like. Um, so this is really just 
an org chart for our finance organization. It's not unlike many other finance organizations that um, Fortune 500 companies. Uh, we started it here with our C CFO, Bill Giles. Um, on the right over here, you see internal audit. We've got, it's not a dotted line on this chart, but a dotted line to the CFO. We really report to the audit committee of the board of directors to keep our independence um, from the company. We've got a tax, treasury, and investor relations group. So this is corporate tax. Our investor relations team really works heavily on our um, press releases and anything we release publicly about the company. Um, and then the treasury department, they obviously work a lot of cash management and transferring funds between countries that we're operating in. Um, under our senior vice president controller there, obviously there are quite a few different departments. Um, traditionally what you think of here is accounting and finance. You've got like your general accounting groups that do a lot of balance sheet reconciliations, period close processes, um, the payroll department, obviously all the 90,000 people that work for office don't have to get paid. So those people are very important. Um, Accounts payable, primarily what you think of, paying your vendors timely. Um, and then we've got an international finance and accounting group just because we operate in Mexico, Brazil. We've got some um, operations in Europe that are all that as well. Um, the strategic procurement group is kind of unique. Their job is really to facilitate competitive bidding processes for any type of um, vendor that we're really looking to do business with. They'll have a number of vendors come in and do a competitive bidding process so that we're ensure that we're getting the best price for whatever it is that we're looking to purchase. And then what I'm going to spend most of my time on here at the beginning of the presentation is really talking through this, you can see where it says assistant corporate controllers, functional area controllers. Um, AutoZone may or may not be like other companies in that we specifically have many like accounting groups for each functional area. Um, and so each one has a what we call control team or controller group and their responsibilities are really just the accounting for that functional area. I'll go into more of that on the next slide. And then internal audit. So what is a control team? Like I said, each functional area has one. And so just so you have an idea of what I'm talking about when I say functional area, um, you can think of these as like big corporate groups in terms of store operations, merchandising, marketing, supply chain, legal, um, e-commerce, things of that sort. So each one has a team that's really responsible for the financial analysis of the team. Primarily these two teams are doing accounting, so period close related items, closing the books for that functional area and doing financial analysis. So some of the things that, way that might work itself out. Um, when I worked on the supply chain control team for two years, I was really responsible for budgeting the expenses. We've got 10 distribution centers across the country. And so I was responsible for forecasting and budgeting the payroll associated with those buildings, the transportation expense to get the product from our distribution centers to the stores, things of that sort, things that I tracked. You know, we do a lot of um, trend analysis in terms of identifying if payroll's growing. Why is payroll growing? Are we processing more pieces through the distribution center? Are our wages going up? Things like that are the types of financial analyses that these groups are primarily working on. Oh. Um, the last bullet really talks about integrating ourselves into the business. So the control team really serves as um, a liaison between the business that they're supporting and the finance organization. Um, so the senior vice president control or the other accounting teams. So the way that they do that is we really strategically place the accounting teams, these control teams, with the business. So each functional area, for example, sits on a different floor. So the control team will sit with the business in order to be involved in the day-to-day -day decision making that's going on provide um, insight into what financial decisions make the most sense for the company. So this is another kind of just slide around responsibilities. So things that I might not have talked about already is I talked about the forecast process. Um, the control teams are really involved in also our annual planning process. So the teams are really responsible for working with the functional area to identify, okay, what are our strategic initiatives for next year? What is that going to cost? What is that going to look like? How can we make the best decisions there? And how can we put together a plan so that um, at the end of the day, they come up with a number and say, here's what our expenses are going to be for the whole year. And throughout that next year, that budget, the actuals that come in are compared to that budget that results from the annual planning process. So it really takes a lot of collaboration from 
the finance team and the business to come up with this number that then the business is held to for the next year. Um, period close, this is kind of what a lot of people think of when they think of industry accounting is closing the books. Um, and that really, what surprised me whenever I moved from internal audit to the, the control team that I worked on was, you know, when I was an internal audit, I was testing the financial controls that these teams were um, operating each and every day. And so that was my view of what the control team was. I saw that piece of it. And what I learned when I got into the group was that that period close process really takes up one week out of the month. So 25% of their time is really around um, closing the books, whereas 75% is these other financial analyses and advising the business. Does anyone have any questions? I forgot to mention at the beginning of the presentation, would love for y'all to just pop in any question you have, um, please interrupt us. We'd love to kind of further discuss anything that you have questions about. Yes. Um, I was wondering, within like, so the different functional areas, each have a control team, do, is it common for people to switch you know, within the control team like to a different functional area? And is that like easy to do? Or? Yes. So our controller specifically is very intentional about getting people a lot of broad exposure. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we'll give hands out to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you. So yeah, he really honestly likes to have people move between groups. So people usually spend two years in a group just to kind of get the first year you're figuring out what you're doing honestly, and then the second year is really just executing at a higher level, improving upon what you've been doing. And so you'll see a lot of people move between groups in the functional areas. And then a lot of people rotate through internal audit too. And I'll talk about that. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Anybody have some questions? Okay. So now we're going to talk a little bit about internal audit. How do we do? So um, what I have on the board here is the definition that the Institute of Internal Auditors gives to what is the role of internal audit. So the Institute of Internal Auditors is the governing board for internal audit groups. Um, and so the three key important aspects that I want you to take away from this role of internal audit is independence, objectivity, and adding value. So we kind of talked a little bit earlier about how we report to the audit committee to ensure our independence. So if we weren't an independent group, it would be hard for us to come into audit a process and give them recommendations that then if we were involved in the process, we'd, we'd be auditing our own work, if that makes sense. So um, we maintain a level of independence so that we can provide those recommendations. Uh, that also helps us to be objective. So if we're independent, we can obviously be objective if we want, then it would be hard to do that. And then the third is adding value. This is something that we really place a lot of emphasis on in our department. We try to build our annual audit plan in a way that we're auditing areas of the company that the recommendations that we provide are gonna add value and help strengthen that process or that group's control structure and help the company meet its objectives. So those are the big three kind of tenets of what our job is as internal auditors. So in the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about how we do that. So in terms of delivering value, we, are, we really try to be collaborative with the business and we wanna be a trusted business partner. So our internal audit department was, um, used to be outsourced to Deloitte about 10 years ago. We brought it in-house. And so over the past 10 years, we've really been working with the company to develop really strong relationships so that we have a seat at the table when the company is making decisions about strategic initiatives, that they call internal audit and say, hey, we're thinking about implementing this new process. Can you come advise us on what types of controls we should put in place and um, how we should structure the process to mitigate any risk? Um, so that's something that we've really been intentional about growing. And you'll hear all internal audit departments really want to be in sync with the business so that you're aware of what's going on, what's changing, because things like this happen quickly. Change happens sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly in companies. Um, and then also so that you can be that partner and advisor. Um, second, we've got on here providing insight through data-driven recommendations. I'm sure in all your classes you're learning a lot about the importance of data analytics and big data. and this is an, an emerging trend, um, not just an in internal audit, but for companies in any department, any organization. And so what we've done as a department is we've created a data analytics group that is responsible for, they don't conduct audits in and of themselves, but they support each of the audit teams from a data standpoint. 
they come in and say, okay, what data is available to us? How can we analyze it? What trends can we identify? What anomalies can we identify to help advise the audit team in order to provide more valuable recommendations to the business or the client? Um, fourth from there, what you primarily think of when you think of internal audit is probably that one, two, three, fourth bullet, ensuring compliance with corporate policies and procedures. We do that as well. Um, that's also a big part of our job. I'll talk about compliance audits in the next slide. Um, annually, we lead the enterprise risk management process for the company. So we go through an annual process where we meet with the leadership of the company to discuss what are the key initiatives that are coming up next year, what risks, what top risks are facing the company, and we really create this risk universe of these are all the major risks that the company is facing, and each one is assigned a business owner, and they provide us updates on that risk, what they're doing to help mitigate the risk, um, to address what's coming up, um, and so they provide us updates quarterly, and we present that information to the audit committee, and that's something that they really value, they find a lot of value in, because as an audit committee and board of directors, they really own that as well. And from that process, that really drives our annual audit plan. So once we've identified this risk universe and we kind of ranked them as these are the top risks, we build our audit plan around those top risks so that we're um, looking at each of the processes that could be impacted by these and do we have appropriate controls and structure in place. Um, the last bullet is really kind of not, you won't see this in all internal audit departments, some are different than the others, but ours is very focused on developing future leaders for the company. So internal audit is almost in some way seen as kind of like a rotational program at AutoZone in that we bring auditors in. We typically hire at the associate level or entry level positions. We have people stay in internal audit two to three years and then we promote them into the business into senior positions or manager positions. Because the exposure that our team gets in internal audit is extremely broad. So if you were to work in accounts payable, you would know a lot about accounts payable and how we pay our vendors and the importance of that and terms and all that information. You would know that. You'd be a subject matter expert in that. Whereas in internal audit, we're auditing every functional area in the company. We are involved in every strategic initiative that the company has going on. So our auditors get an extremely broad view of what the company does, how the different groups work together, and the importance of risks and controls. So obviously, as we're auditing, our auditors are learning about how to identify risks, how to identify what's a control or where a control needs to be in place so that when they're in the business, you have leaders that understand those concepts and perform their duties with that in mind. So now the fun stuff. I'll talk a little bit about the types of audits that we do. Um, I'm going to have Drew and Nishin kind of help me to talk about some of their audits as well. Um, so first, strategic audits. This is kind of what you would think of as like advisory or consulting type projects. So these are ones where I talked about we come in with the business on the front end and kind of help advise. We, we never tell the business this is the control you should put in place, this is how you should design it, this is how it should operate, because essentially we could not come back in and then audit that if we directed the business that this is what they should do. So we really just serve as an advisor and partner in helping them identify like, hey, this is a risk, you might want to build a control in here, or you might need to think differently about this process in order to mitigate the risk. Um, so that our inventory availability project is something that our team was really involved in. Um, what that means is we were trying to get our inventory closer to our customer. So our stores used to receive one week, one time a week deliveries from the distribution center to the store. And so the question was asked, well, should we deliver more frequently so that we're backfilling that sold inventory more quickly and we're keeping the inventory close to our customer? And so internal audit was involved in helping the business think through that process and what's the appropriate look, frequency of delivery and what should those factors be based on. So we were really partnered with them in making that decision. Um, operational audits, these are, we sometimes refer to these as like process improvement type audits. So we'll go in and flow chart out a process from beginning to end. 
identify the risks and, and controls, and then essentially show the business, hey, here's where your weaknesses are. You might want how, what kind of process or change in the process can you um, implement to improve the control structure to mitigate the risk. Um, last year, we did an audit of our fleet management program. So our company leases about 15,000 vehicles for our commercial programs. So what those vehicles are responsible for, they deliver parts from our stores to those commercial customers that I talked about earlier. And so we that's all leased. And so it's managed in-house, but we worked with the fleet management department to kind of help them say, hey, here are some things that you might want to take back to your third party that maybe they could do a little differently to advise you and be a better business partner. Um, we identified about $30,000 in money that the vendor owed us. So the, the business, it really helped build that partnership with the fleet management group. Um, financial audits, what do you all think of when you think of audit or attesting to the fairness of financial data or liability of the data? Um, I'm gonna let Nosheen talk about some financial audits that we've done recently because she's worked on two since she's been in the group. Yeah, so um, the first, well I actually just joined the internal audit about six months ago before that I was in a different control group um, and the transition is very easy. Uh, so the first one that I've worked on was the warranty to reserve audit and that was pretty much going in and assessing whether the reserve that we've got set for our warranty reserves is accurate. Um, and so we involved our data analytics team heavily to make sure that the data that we're using was appropriate and being pulled from the right sources. Um, recently, we were working on the lease accounting standards. So you guys know about the ASD 42 adoption. So AutoZone adopted that as of nine months, our new fiscal year. Um, so internal audit was called in to make sure the valuation was correct and um, the company wasn't compliant with all the requirements that was needed to, to be compliant with the new accounting standard change. So um, it, it was a very challenging audit. We're wrapping it up currently, but um, it was a great exposure. And um, that's just one of the, uh, or a couple of examples of the financial standards audit that, that our team performs. Um, so the last one that I'll talk about are legal and compliance type audits. So what we're doing here is we're providing assurance the company that we have controls in place to adhere with any government regulations or company policies and procedures. Um, and so what that kind of looks like is we'll take, for example, California is an extremely litigious state. And so we went in last quarter and said, okay, here are the California wage and hour laws. This is what the state requires us to do. And then we looked in and said, okay, here's what our current process is. Where do we not match up with the guidelines? Where do we have exposure to primarily class action lawsuits? A lot of these happen in California. And so um, we were really able to work cross-functionally with our legal team, store operations, and human resources together to kind of identify, hey, here's some extremely large gaps in compliance. How can we fill the gap and improve the process? Um, I'm not gonna to talk too heavily on IT audits because Drew is our IT audit extraordinaire. Um, he's gonna talk a little bit about those on his slides later on. So we'll take that later. But that's kind of the overview of internal audit. So I have questions. Uh, in regards to uh, the company that was part in California, is there a certain does like is there like a mergers and acquisitions section or is that all I have to do with strategic Strategic Planning and Business Development Group does that. Yeah, so we acquired all data back in like 1996, but more recently we did acquire two other companies in California, um, Auto Anything, which is like an online retailer of automotive parts, and then we acquired IMC, which they really focus on like import parts, um, and so we invested those uh, last year actually. So. But maybe European or is that? They did, they did European, Japanese, Korean, all types of import parts. Yeah, they weren't really financially beneficial businesses for us, so we got rid of them. Yeah. So you said you can move from one like department into internal auditing. Mm -hmm. So would that mean that like when you move into internal auditing, do they try to not let you audit your own? Work also. That's a good question, yes, because I, so I've been back in internal audit for a year now, and um, specifically, the, we do a key reserve audit every year, and so this year, the team really wanted to audit the UNICAP reserve, which is our uniform capitalization reserve for the capitalizing cost of inventory, and I used to calculate that reserve 
previously. So we've had to wait a year or so to be able to audit that because I would have been auditing my own work essentially. So yeah, there's kind of like a cooling off period if you move in and audit. Good question. So you mentioned you used to outsource like the internal audit to another firm. Is that very common with like larger public companies to do that, or is it more common to be like in house? That's a good question. Um, there are a lot of people that do. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure of the breakout of percentages, um, but for the publicly traded companies that are in Memphis that I can think of, so you've got us, FedEx, um, IP. They all have their own. Yeah, and we're, I guess, rural uh, publicly traded companies and might not be able to attract accountants there, so a lot of times they'll get an outside firm to come in and be their outsourced internal audit, so that's pretty good. All right. Any questions? Okay, I'm going to let Nashi talk a little bit about the comparisons between internal and external audit. So again, my name is Nusheen Bogan, and I've been with AutoZone for about four and a half years now. I've um, been with Internal Audit for six months, and prior to that, my entire time was in the finance control group. So like Leah mentioned earlier, um, there's a lot of transition going on between different groups, and it's very easy to do so. Um, you just pretty much have to express your interest in going to a different group and talk to your upper management, and they definitely make that happen. So, um, so I was able to do that. Um, so before we jump into the key differences, I kind of wanted to just touch base on some of the similarities between internal and external audits so you guys can kind of have that in the back of your mind and then we'll talk more about the differences. Um, so the first one I wanted to touch base was just on the structure of both groups. Um, they both have what's called a planning phase, a field work and reporting phase, so where they actually plan the audit, do the testing, and then provide re reporting um, results to management. Uh, and so the, the type of work that's done in each of those areas is slightly different. Um, the other piece is the standards. So both internal and external audit have specific standards that they follow um, in order to comply with rules and regulations. And then the third piece is collaboration. So both of these groups tend to want to collaborate with each other to be able to have a smooth audit transition, um, primarily for the SOX work that, that we do, but then also on other EY relying audits. So in, in our case, when um, I brought up the lease accounting audit that we just did, uh, Ernst and Young are our external auditors, so they heavily rely on the work that internal audit performed. Um, so just that that coordination with each other is of immense importance to kind of have some transition. Um, so some of the key differences, uh, Leah touched base on a lot of this stuff. Uh, definition, obviously the, the biggest pieces was the independence, objectivity, and adding value to the business and making sure you're providing um, advice on how the business operations can improve and enhance. Um, external auditors, they pretty much come in and examine a company's financial records and they ultimately have to issue an opinion on their financials being free from material misstatements. So that's kind of like their main goal and focus. Um, purpose kind of, we covered that as well as saying like the, the review business processes and just provide advice for future improvement. Uh, for external audit, they want to ultimately validate that question when they ask, do you make as much money as you say you do? So the way they do that is by coming in and um, testing different balances, transactions, financial records, things like that to ultimately issue their opinion. Uh, internal auditors are audits that they're conducted by internal employees in the company, so all of us are part of the internal audit department. Um, typically, that's usually the case that so they have an internal audit department, and if not, they can outsource it to a third party. External auditors are typically conducted by members outside of the firm, so they're external. Um, scope for internal audit, so we, we, I think we touched base on this a little earlier too. So in addition to just looking at financial reporting, things like that, internal audit may also look at like governance processes, um, risk management strategies, things like that, just to kind of see how the company is doing in ways that they can improve their processes. Uh, and external audit's main scope is to look at the financial statements and make sure that they're free from material misstatements. So when they actually set materiality threshold, and when we talk about that, um, we're speaking to for them to set a materiality threshold based on, for instance, a specific line item on your financial statement. So if, for example, they consider revenue and they look at that and they say maybe they want to set the threshold at 1%. So if a company is making $190 million in revenue, for instance, their materi materiality threshold would be that 1.9 million if it's set at 1%. So anything above that level is um, significant enough to cause a material misstatement on a financial statement. 
Um, reporting internal auditors typically report to the audit committee, whereas external auditors primarily their responsibility is with their shareholders, and those audits are overseen by the PCOB. Internal audit, their audit is typically management, so they use the reports that are published at the end of the, the uh, audit to improve business processes. Uh, whereas for external audit, those reports are typically used by shareholders, investors, creditors, things like that. And then a few other items that fall under the other category. Um, for internal audits, they are the discussion of management. Typically, follow-ups are required, so we usually uh, reach out to the businesses after providing recommendations to see if they've been implemented. And then um, they're regulated by the in Institute of Internal Auditors. And then for external audit, those are required for publicly traded companies. Um, usually there's no follow-up unless they start doing like a plan for next year and they're regulated by the PCOB. So just kind of giving you guys a personal experience. Um, I was with Ernst Young for three years before coming to AutoZone. So I've seen the external side and then been with the finance control group for four years. So seeing that side of uh, AutoZone and then now with internal audit. So I kind of got experience in all three of those areas. Um, and the biggest piece I could probably say is for external audit, you get exposure to a lot of different industries. Um, my time at Ernst Young, I got to work in the biotech industry. Um, I got to work on FedEx and the career services and also in the foods management industry. So that was, it was a pretty neat exposure. Um, internal audit, I can say the past six months, the biggest thing, I think Leah touched base on this too, where uh, the, the, the main objective or focus is to be a trusted business partner with the organization. So we kind of see that um, in hands throughout the audits that we do. Um, just a few, I guess, different facts about external and internal audit. You obviously get dinner on site when you're working late hours, so keeping that in mind. Um, there's a ton of happy hours. Uh, there's a lot of travel involved, so if you guys like doing that, that's definitely um, something ex external audit offers. And then when you're thinking about how much hour, how many hours you're putting into working, um, compare that to your salary, obviously it's very insignificant, <laughs> but then when you think about the experience that you get in such a short amount of time, I mean, that's the biggest trade-off, so. Um, any questions before we turn it over to you? Yeah, um, can you talk more about the difference when you say outsourcing um, auditors for the internal audit purposes versus hiring external auditors? It's like outsourcing your internal audit department. Mm -hmm. So prior to our um, previous VP setting up our group, Deloitte and Touche were, they were the auditors that did the internal audit for AutoZone. And so primarily, they were responsible for SOX testing, which I did not even talk about, so I'm glad you brought this up. Um, they, they did a lot of SOX testing, and that was provided to EY. And so that was primarily the scope of what they did. They weren't doing a whole lot of process type audits. They weren't trusted business advisor, you know, to the business, it was primarily do we have the socks work done? Can you do the socks work? And that was pretty much it um, on that vein. So I did not talk about socks. Um, that's about 30% of the time that we spend in a year on audits. is spent on financial socks related audits. Um, so that's testing. We do walkthroughs um, and tested controls for every functional area, all the major controls of the company. And EY heavily relies on our work. So. Um, they have a direct assistance model with us, which essentially means we're like loan staff for them. So we perform the work, we provide it to them, they review, provide comments. And so that's about half of the controls that we test, we provide back to them. And so it's really a value to the business because that reduces the fees that we then have to pay EY to do the audit. Um, so it's really important that we have a strong partnership with them because we're working so closely together. We're providing our work to them. They're utilizing it for their audit. Um, so there's a lot of collaboration there, and um, it provides a lot. Our CEO and CFO, are, they care a lot about it, and so it's very important that we work closely with them. We try to reduce their fees as much as we can by taking on as much of that testing as we can. Um, it's not the most glamorous work, I will say, but um, as someone who led so the Sox audit twice when I was in audit previously, you, it gives you a lot of exposure to you're seeing every important financial control that the company has in place. And so by testing those, you're getting a very broad view of, okay, this is what's keeping our financial statements materially accurate. And so knowing that, especially if you then go into a control team, which is what it ended up happening for me, um, I knew all the inputs 
to, to what was coming to me in supply chain and I knew where it was going. And so that helped me do my job better as a supply chain financial analyst, if that makes sense. Yeah. How do y'all handle like independence issues if you're if like EY is relying really heavily on what on like the work that you're doing, but you're also like trying to have a seat at the table with like top management, you said. So how do you balance independence with that? So they assess our competence every year. So they'll ask us how many people on your team are CPAs, how many people on your, what's the experience level on your team. So they have to assess our competence as auditors before they can rely on our work um, from that standpoint. Um, and then with the with they're primarily relying on us for SOX related controls. And so whenever we're talking about being an interest, that works with SOX control as well. But when we're talking about having a seat at the table, that type of stuff, it's really with like strategic initiatives of the company. Um, so yeah, there's there's an importance that we don't tell the business this is the control you need to put in place, or this is the control we're gonna put in place. We don't dictate to management what they do. We try to advise and say, hey, here's the risk. You know, here's what other people might have done, but we never dictate to the company this is what you should do. Okay. So that's kind of how we maintain that, so that we're not auditing something that we've then told someone okay. to put in place. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you have a question? Okay, sorry. Good. I'm turning it over to Drew to talk about the most interesting topic of business. I don't know about that. <laughs> uh, before I get started, how many of y'all maybe heard about IT auditing before this? Yeah. A lot better than me. And when I started, I had no idea. It was just the first job offered to me after my internship as a financial auditor. And I was like, yeah, I'll take a job. So, <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, but what I'm going to do is kind of give you an overview of what IT auditing is, uh, kind of some of the risks that drive IT auditing, uh, some of the, I guess, processes, controls that you would look at as an IT auditor, and then kind of my, my experience being coming from public accounting to industry, some of the differences between there and then outside of SOX, what, what other opportunities are there for an IT auditor that would create jobs? Uh, so an IT audit is the examination and evaluation of an organization's information technology controls, policies, procedures. And an IT audit's main goal is to evaluate the effectiveness of their controls that protect corporate assets, ensure data integrity, and make sure that the IT is overall aligned with the business. Often we'll see the IT and business aren't aligned and that creates a lot of issues, creates a lot of delays in projects. So there's good value in an IT audit. And primarily, there's three risks that really drive an IT audit. It doesn't have to be all these risks, but for the most part, every audit that I've been a part of in my five years doing this have come from one of these risks. And I'll try to tie it back to kind of accounting. Uh, integrity of data availability of data and confidentiality of the data. Integrity of data, what that is saying is, is the data within this system free from error or fraud? Availability of data is talking about if my system were to crash and I need to provide support to the external auditors, can I recover that data by backup? Is it readily available for timeliness of financial statements or whatever else you're trying to prove to regulators, external auditors, and so forth. And confidentiality of data is talking about least privilege, the need to know. So you probably don't want everyone in your organization to be able to make you know, account balance changes, uh, change invoice. You probably want to restrict that to a limited amount of people. And then obviously once you've identified IT risk in your IT risk universe, uh, focus on what we would call IT general controls. These are, like any other financial controls, these are here to mitigate IT risk. So there's three primary areas that you would probably see over your lifespan as an IT auditor. It could go way beyond this or way in detail, but for the most part, you'll see this on Sarbanes-Oxley as an IT auditor, as well as a lot of other regulatory audits. Access controls are really dealing with the integrity of data and confidentiality of data. Change management is dealing with integrity of data. And then operations is dealing with integrity and availability of data. So we talked about password settings. You would think that's the first thing that would keep a system confidential or keep data integrity. 
But there's also something that's super important, IT segregation of duties. So, show of hands, how many people have seen office space, or is that way for you all? Okay, go <laughs> yeah. So the big theme in there was there was a bunch of layoffs happening at this organization. A developer had elevated privileges to be able to make a code change to steal a penny per transaction. Well, he made an error and I think stole like 10 cents per transaction and ended up with millions of dollars from the company. That can happen with elevated privileges, that someone could make a source code change behind the software that an auditor would never see. So that's one risk we would look at. Another one is um, system administrators or super users. You probably want that separate from your business. You don't want someone who can provision users, do everything within the system. You probably want that restricted to IT people that don't have any idea of the business controls or some of the things that would catch if they were doing something suspicious. Uh, access provisioning and deprovisioning, all that means is that controls around granting, removing, and changing user access to a system. So one thing we would look at for that are help desk tickets, emails, making sure that a person granted that system was thought through by someone outside of the person that granted it. If I'm granting everyone access, how do I know it's all appropriate? I could be setting up whoever I want to. Change management. This is talking about making software changes, source code changes to software within an environment. A lot of people think, hey, I do a patch or I do some type of change, my system's gonna work fine, it's gonna calculate everything properly, I'm gonna be able to make sales to customers. That's never the case. If you make one little change, you could affect anything communicating with that system. So you have to be able to test that in an offline environment and to make sure that it's working properly. Operations. Uh, this is talking about data backup and recovery, making sure there's backup processes in place that you can restore your backups, and then batch processing. One thing at AutoZone, we have, what, 5,800 stores in the USA, is that right, roughly? They all have a point of sale system. They do a batch process every night to our general ledger. If no one's monitoring that to make sure it completed successfully, or doing a reconciliation, how do you know it's getting there? So that is one thing we would look at. And then my personal experiences with uh, IT auditing. Here are a few regulations I want to talk about. Just HIPAA, GOVA, PCI, CCPA, GDPR that create opportunities for IT auditor. Uh, HIPAA stands for Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Every year if you are accepting Medicare and Medicaid, you have to do a risk assessment. That creates a lot of jobs for audit, IT auditors and compliance personnel. Graham Leach Wiley Act, that's the Privacy Act over banking and uh, credit unions, so financial institutions. They are required to do a periodic security audit. That creates jobs for IT auditors. Uh, PCI, that's the payment card industry. If I accept six million or more uh, credit card transactions a year, I'm required to do a PCI audit by someone who's qualified. That creates opportunity. And then these two, I'm sure, will create an opportunity, but they just came out, so I'll talk a little about, about what we're doing at AutoZone for CCPA. This is coming out in January 2020. Uh, what this is, is a customer of ours that's a California resident wants us to forget anything we had to do with that customer, so like think about the rewards or loyalty, loyalty program. We have to be able to track that data within our systems and within our vendor systems and delete it. If we don't, we can be fined up to $750 per customer by the state of California. So everyone is dealing with this, it gets excessive, but that's a lot of work to be done to track down where, uh, where our data is, and everyone's frantic about it. Honestly, California is probably the first of many states to enact laws like this. Yeah, it gets crazy. Um, so, kind of what they were talking about earlier, Leah and Machine, there's a lot of operational compliance for us that kind of tie into IT auditing that you would do as an internal auditor, or if you go into a heavily, heavily regulated industry, such as banking or healthcare. Uh, there's several control environments that, the control frameworks and environments that we look at as IT auditors. NIST, COZO, COVID are very common. And generally this is what I'm doing at AutoZone. I worked at a public accounting firm. I was an outsourced uh, 
internal auditor as well, so I did a lot of that as well. But if you go into external audit, typically my experience with other firms and other uh, people that have gone this route as an IT auditor, you're focusing on Sarbanes-Oxley generally or SOC uh, reports. Does anyone, have y'all learned about SOC reports or anything like that? Okay. Uh, all that is is say if I'm your outsourced payroll, so I get your uh, employee data, I process your payroll, or I'm storing your data on my servers because you don't want to pay for servers. Typically they pay a CPA to come issue an opinion on the effectiveness of their security controls and processing controls. So there's various SOC reports related to that that you would, it's pretty common for external audit firms. My other experience was that in industry, you don't really travel because IT department's kind of in one building. I want to go talk to information security or DevOps or whatever, I just go to a different floor. Um, external audit, you're probably traveling unless you're in a market where you know, your clients are just there by the firm. So, I hope you all, all learned a little bit about the differences between industry and, and extra audit and public accounting. Uh, are there any questions for us? Um, with, in regards to security, um, is it outsourced or is it more in-house? Because I know some some big companies to tend to outsource it there. Yeah, you, you can do it either way. Typically what they'll do is they'll have most of security in-house and then they'll have ethical hackers or penetration testers is what they're called come in and do a penetration test to test their security. And uh, also PCI, they typically get like an outsourced PCI auditor to come in, maybe a, a NIST consultant. So there's a lot of consultant opportunities, but like the information security officer could be outsourced, but for the most part, the public trade companies are in-house. Right. And uh, in regards to just audit in general, is it still like limited in travel, with, uh, even if you're not in IT? Um, internal audit? Yeah. It depends. Um, so we, just from my personal experience, Matt, we were acquiring companies. There was a lot of travel back and forth to California to do due diligence on these companies. So it kind of depends on how the company's structured. One of our audit managers worked for a company called ABB. They're like a multinational company. And so he spent all of his time traveling to different companies, different operating units. So they had companies in Switzerland, um, other countries in the UK, India, China, and so every two weeks he was traveling all over the globe. Whereas our operations are pretty centrally located. We've got an internal audit group in Mexico at our international headquarters, so we don't do a ton of travel. Okay. And I didn't really talk about it, but there are a lot of financial internal audit positions for financial institutions uh, based on how big the bank is. They're required to do annual audits, get state regulators, so there's a lot of opportunity outside of working for public charity companies. So um, when you guys were having Deloitte as your internal auditor, the EY, was that, were they still your external auditor? Do they have to be different? Like, could like Deloitte also be your internal and external? Or do they have to be separate and independent? You can for some non-public companies, but uh -huh. for publicly traded companies, I don't think you can. For the people that um, had worked in external before, like what are some advantages with internal auditing? Like are something that you like more with internal auditing than you did with external? Um, I can, they're both in the group like six months. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> From what I've seen so far, I know there's definitely a more work-life balance. Um, there's, uh, there's times when obviously like during businesses and stuff, you know, you're working way throughout the night and stuff and um, just coming into internal audit like you're you're exposed to the same type of work but you, you do it at a more normal eight to five type deal um, so you still get the, the same, same type of exposure in terms of like planning the audit going through all of like the field work um, talking to different management groups things like that and then ultimately showing the reports you get to ultimately see the, the end result of what you've done um, in that instance but I would just say like the biggest piece of um, was a whole work-life balance, and then I think I touched base on this earlier, where um, in internal audit I could really sense the the need for wanting to be a, a good a business partner with the with the organization. So um, that's just been like one of the key differentiators that I've kind of noticed. How does um, the promotion of 
position structure differ between internal audit and external audit, or if the positions look like kind of the same? That's a good question. Um, so in um, public accounting, there's a pretty structured every year or so you're getting a promotion. The first few years in the internal audit are similar. It's about a year or 18 months to be promoted up until about senior auditor. And then once you get to senior and want to become a manager, the roles are different from like your responsibilities in public accounting versus the responsibilities within a company, or that's what we've seen at AutoZone. And so it takes a little bit longer to get to manager at a public company or at a company sure. rather than internal audit. But it really is just kind of based on the individual too, because I, I became manager in five years and I didn't have any time in public accounting, and that's about the same time. So it really just depends on the individual timing. Opportunity. Opportunity, yeah. And same thing with external audit. Like there's like there's like, there's like a structure, but then there's instances where you may outperform your other peers and they might be considered a promotion. So that, that happens too at times. Or most of your team leaves and then Thank <laughs> you. 
category? Uh, control teams for 300. <laughs> the percentage of time that is spent on period close activities. Yes. 30%. Oh.
control fees. I mentioned this a few times this week. What is forecasting?